Well, let's maybe kick things off here. <coughs> uh, welcome to uh, one of the most enigmatically titled sessions here, Behind Only Perhaps No. Um, I am Seth Gregory. I'm the practice lead at Navigation Arts. I run the Drupal team there. Uh, to my right over here is Ted Slasinski, one of our senior developers. And uh, we're here to talk to you today about how Drupal secured the defense sector. Wow, that's big. So what it actually is, for those of you who've read the, the description, was a, a really big Drupal intranet build for a security sector company. Uh, we do have an alternate title for the, for the presentation too. Um, <coughs> so in the security sector, in the defense sector that is, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that they don't want you to talk about. And incidentally, one of those things here is the name of the company. So we won't be talking about the name of the client and per their request, we won't be able to walk through or show you the site, but we're gonna talk about a lot of interesting stuff that we ran into while we were developing the site. <coughs> so we're gonna follow just kind of a, a basic outline here of talking about the client and what we actually can say about them. Some of their background, the problems they were dealing with. Uh, we're gonna take a look at some of the business aspects of the project and details of the solution. Um, so we'll kind of break it down into a, a business analysis portion and then we'll get into the challenges where it's kind of unfair to say the challenges because like every project, there are an awful lot of challenges here. But we'll get into the technical weeds with a handful of challenges that we came up against. Uh, some of the ones that really stood out um, and just as a quick overview, stuff like legacy browser support in a big organization. Uh, the challenges of working in a super ultra secured environment for the networks and servers performance concerns and issues, uh, user authentication, single sign-on, and then this, the big one, a separate extranet version of the site. <coughs> so let's jump into the client. And uh, you know, who is this, this mystery client? Well, it's top secret. Uh, but we know that they are a defense contractor who is a massive multinational corporation uh, 120,000 or more global employees, including uh, contractors and people who are not full-time employees who need access to this information. They're composed of many discrete business units across the organization, so people who deal with things in different areas of the sector. And each of those business units had its own intranet, a lot of times more than one. They might have an HR intranet and a developer's intranet and a place where they store all their documents, and it was just massive with no way to easily share information across all of these disparate parts of the organization. <coughs> so change was needed, clearly. They knew it, we knew it. They came to us because they're one globally distributed international corporation with more than 60 existing individual intranets serving 120,000 people. And across all of those, zero unified designs or branding or functionality that's common across the enterprise. We had a, an anecdote from them that they actually had a culture of one-upsmanship with their designers where somebody, one of these groups would put up a new intranet and they'd spend all this time and effort on a new design that had nothing to do with the corporate branding. And they'd say, hey, check out, check out this cool site. And then somebody else would go and do one better and they're spinning their wheels, spending a lot of time doing this and nobody could find anything. So they needed a solution, and the solution was one intranet to rule them all. Uh, to take the place, really, of all these individual siloed sites, um, and it, it was not a new idea there. Um, they actually tried three times before in the past decade, and every single time before it gained critical mass to take off with consensus, it failed because of that lack of consensus. Uh, a large number of stakeholders are involved here. And uh, <laughs> I love getting Lord of the Rings stuff in here, but it's kind of apropos with the ring because whenever things are centralized, and I experienced this in the world of academia as well, there's this hesitation from the individual groups that they don't want to lose their identity or feel like they're being strong-armed by corporate into a single solution. 
Um, and they were having a, a lot of trouble overcoming that. So they needed some help, and they engaged us at NavArts to help them get through that. So the company really had five main stated objectives that they came to us with. They wanted to facilitate internal communication and employee engagement. They wanted to improve productivity, because who doesn't? Uh, they wanted to reflect and confirm their internal corporate culture. Reduce information silos, like we talked about, with all of those 60 separate intranets. And along with that, assist in the knowledge sharing and management so that something awesome is happening over here and it's on that intranet, but the people over here have no idea. How can they take advantage of that? And it's really important to, to share that knowledge within the corporation. <coughs> So to do this, they knew, they knew that they needed a CMS, but what CMS are they going to go with? Drupal was not a given at all in the early stages. Um, like many of these massive corporations, it's very much a Windows world over there. Uh, they have a heavy existing investment in SharePoint. And in fact, some of those failed attempts that they had tried before were based on SharePoint. Um, it's also a very active relationship with Adobe. Uh, CQ sites across the organization, so CQ5 was very much in the mix, in the running. And part of it really just comes from having very little prior exposure to Drupal. Um, they were skeptical of its ability to drive a massive enterprise intranet like the one they were envisioning. And, and they had concerns with security. I mean, is, th is this safe? From what I hear, Drupal is this free open source software that people from the internet work on and contribute to as a community. Um, and uh, so what we did was we had a list of over 500 requirements that we had to pour through and figure out what, what was the right solution for this. And we knew for what they wanted, Drupal was the right way to go. But we had to convince them that it was up to the task. So one of the things we do at NavArts, because we're not just a Drupal shop, we have a site core practice and a Java practice and a few other CMSs that we deal with, we do CMS evaluations for clients and look at their requirements and say, okay, well, what, what's going to be best for this? What's going to be best for that? And kind of score it at the end. And Drupal came away as the clear winner um, from that kind of bake-off that we did. And that gave it a big boost. They were leaning toward Drupal, but it was still a bit of an uphill climb. So there was still some work to do to really secure this project for as a Drupal project. <coughs> So Dries the other day talked about Drupal standing on the shoulders of giants, and I think in the enterprise space, we really stand on the shoulders of some early adopters and other big mega corporations that have gone with Drupal. So pointing out big clients like NBC Universal and Tesla, and obviously the White House is something that's always brought up. I mean, if it's good enough for the president, it should be good enough for you. Um, <laughs> uh, so that really helped us out. Um, but we still had to convince their security team that Drupal was secure. Uh, the Drupal security team themselves really do an awful lot of work and go a long way toward answering those questions for us. I mean, they're constantly watching and responding, as well as the community, um, with alerts and patches and things that, that help make that less of an issue than it is with some other open source CMS products. But despite that, all software that's presented to this company for installation, whether it's Apache or MySQL or an individual Drupal module, uh, needed to be vetted and approved. Uh, the actual versions of it that, you know, they had to run static analysis against it and things like that. So it was uh, pretty intense. And uh, we held a lot of rounds of demos with the stakeholders. So there were a lot of stakeholders involved from each of these different groups. And a lot of times people say, oh, Drupal, I hear, I hear Drupal is really good, but I don't know what it even is or looks like. So doing that for people around the world means screen shares, means in-person meetings. And uh, I think after they really got a hands-on feel for it and what the authoring experience would be like compared to what they might be used to with SharePoint, et cetera, um, they were not only accepting of Drupal as a solution, but they were really excited for it. So. We were psyched about that. <clears throat> so with any CMS, the content is centrally important. I mean, it's a content management system. And they had a ton of content and a lot of opinions on how it should be structured, um, how it should be displayed, 
So that list of 500 requirements I was talking about and the dozens of stakeholders that contributed to it, in some cases, they were mutually exclusive requirements. They conflicted with each other. They had to be worked through. And even with a client who's great to work with, when you have that many people and that much consensus to gather, it can be, I think herding cats is the term that, that comes to mind. So um, before the technical stuff was even a possibility, big shout out to my colleagues back at NavArts, the people who are the designers, the IAs and BAs and project managers who went through round after round of design and, and client discussion to make that happen. The key for us to getting this past that stage where it failed so many times before for them was really making a system that was painless to manage. That it was okay for some of these people who had their own intranets to lose some breadth of functionality if the quality and depth of the functionality they were gaining as a whole made up for it. So we had to standardize on a set of content types that would actually accurately represent all that content that they had from all the different business units. We had to talk about how that content would interrelate with each other, those pieces of content, and the taxonomy. It, it was a long process. <clears throat> personalization, where I'm sure all of you out there who are building sites are hearing this more and more. We need personalization on our sites. We need to have content that finds the user. So for instance, on the home page, they wanted to have content that was relevant to the logged in user's geographic location, to their business unit, where did they work? You know, show me blog posts from my local leadership, but corporate also wants to be able to push out communications to anybody across the organization, and there was just no way to do that before. And finally, they, they really had this need for what they called one-click functionality, things that a lot of us take for granted um, and have for years, like, oh, I'm viewing an event. Let me click this button to add it to my Outlook calendar. Well, that was hard for them um, because there was no central events calendar. There was no nothing like that. A really good example of that is the time card system for reporting their time. There were more than 15 different time card systems across this organization, and it, it, you had to dig to find which one and where. So. Even just something as simple as providing a single link that said time card that would use the user's attributes to figure out which one should I redirect them to was a huge win for them. Um, it's really bad when you lose productivity by trying to find the place where you're supposed to report the hours that you spent working. So, <clears throat> I just took a drink at a really awkward time, but I'm gonna introduce my colleague Ted come up and talk about the, uh, the presentation stuff. Thank you, Seth. So the presentation, um, they want a personal experience. Um, things like weather based on facility location, news based on location, or news based on business area. We also gave employees transparency, the ability to view content of other business areas to support the company's effort to create a one company culture. We were able to give their editors an organized library for their pictures and video and allowed for consistent presentation when used in content like articles or blog posts or search by it. And we gave them the ability to search it by its field information, which we were able to compile from their exit data. Um, the power of C-Tools provided granular presentation of content. We use panels, which integrates great with views. So panels is great. It provided a number of benefits. In order to provide dynamic, user-centric content, we use context-based panel panes that display information based on a user's attributes like facility or business area. We also created custom panels layouts, so we were able to customize the markup in the CSS. This allowed us to create responsive layouts with semantic HTML5 markup on the client side, and it also made it easy for administrators and content publishers in the UI while giving them the customization and the flexibility that they needed. So the front end, we built uh, responsive themes so that employees are now able to easily view the intranet on 
company phones and tablets. We simplified the whole theming process using style sheets pre-processed with SAS and Compass, and we designed it for modern browsers to gracefully degrade using JavaScript libraries like Modernizer and HTML5 Shiv. Uh, we created view modes. We used custom templates for displaying Section 508 compliant content, and anytime we showed summarized displays of node content, we were able to reuse it anywhere we use views or panels. So the challenges. They needed legacy support. They had complex servers. Um, they had detailed specs for performance. They had specific requirements for authentication. And they wanted an extranet. They wanted users outside of their internal network to be able to view content of the site. So unfortunately, even though the platform was designed to gracefully degrade, at launch, the employees issued computers had Internet Explorer 8 installed by default, and they did not have Windows permissions to upgrade. So the company was aware of this and working to roll out IE updates, but we weren't able to expedite this process before launch. So we had to include full support for every browser. So this presented some interesting challenges. For example, Video.js was used for handling video. Uh, 4X only supports IE9 and up, so we did have to provide a fallback for IE8 during the period of time that employees were on this browser. So, you know, this is a little different from normal sites that we work on. You know, we normally can SSH right into the servers. Um, so not being able to directly SSH in, we, you know, we had to go through several authentication layers, more than one login to get in. Um, initial testing of code was done on our own company servers, and we didn't have the ability to replicate some of their exact authentication and hardware. Um, we used install profiles, uh, features, and migrate scripts to provide content so all developers were able to see the same thing. And we tested the basic functionality on their machines initially as a proof of concept. And when we knew how their systems work, we were able to build our functionality on top. And I'm going to, sorry. Um, so this is uh, different from most sites we build in Drupal. Um, all user traffic was authenticated. Um, so we weren't able to do full page caching. We weren't able to use a reverse proxy like Varnish. And um, another thing is their start page, this would be their start page for all of their web browser installations. So this created an interesting scenario where they had these massive login waves whenever their users logged into their machines at the start of the business day from a certain time zone. So I'm gonna pass it back to Seth to tell you how we did that. Thanks, Ted. Um, so yeah, this, you know, we got some traffic statistics from them, uh, your average day, your average week of traffic, and all of that kind of went out the window once they said, well, we're planning on making this our start page for all of our users, because then it became a fire drill, right? 8 a.m., East Coast comes online, 20,000 users hit your site in the course of five minutes. Even if they're just going to check their email, they're opening up the web browser, they're authenticating and logging in. So we had to think about performance tuning quite a bit. Um, we had a, really with any Drupal site, the, the, the database back end, even if you're using load balanced web nodes, becomes kind of a single point of failure um, and something that you rely on. So we had a dedicated MySQL server, a uh, very beefy chunk of RAM allocated so that we could keep as much in memory as possible. And we worked with their server people to set up and run load tests that would simulate some of these massive login waves in short periods of time. And uh, while they were running those and after, we looked at log files and we used some tools like uh, some of you might have used uh, the MySQL Tuner Perl script or MySQL Tuning Primer. I think it's going to be really hard to see, but an example of the kind of output that you get from something like that will show you the percentage of reads to writes that you're seeing, um, things that might need some indexes added to them manually. So you can really kind of hone in on where the issues are. 
um, and how your config is for MySQL and tweak that to improve performance. So we did a lot of work just tweaking what we had before we started adding more and more balanced servers. Uh, and the load balanced web nodes, you know, anybody who's done load balanced Drupal before uh, knows that there can be tricky sometimes. Uh, you can have a shared files area. It was on a, a mounted NetApp backend. Um, all kinds of fun things to think about with the load balancing algorithms and round robin versus sticky sessions. Continuing on that kind of tack of alleviating some of the load from MySQL. Uh, we used memcache. We moved all, uh, as many of the cache tables as we could into memcache, so that was cached in memory instead of hitting the database, and uh, distributed it amongst all the load balanced web nodes so that everything was consistent across them. And if one of them dropped off, you know, the rest would, would pick up the load. Perhaps one of the biggest performance gains we got, you know, Ted mentioned that we weren't able to put varnish in front of this. We weren't able to turn on Drupal's page caching. But Panel's hash cache is awesome. Um, this basically lets you take each of those individual little panel panes on your page and cache them for some subset of users based on a key that you can define. So you can say, okay, everybody whose home facility is in Los Angeles and is in the, the Drupal department at this company um, is going to see this pane. So let's cache it for that combination of users and show that to them instead of regenerating it every time. Uh, and that cut down page load time significantly, particularly for things like those five minute login periods where the content hasn't changed, it's just everybody getting served the same thing. <coughs> Another thing that really helped out with alleviating the load from MySQL uh, was actually an unintended side effect of using Search API. So a lot of the views on the site surfaced content that needed to be searchable or filterable. So for instance, the list of news articles. You might say, show me all the news articles that have to do with Drupal and the Los Angeles facility. And it's going to do a faceted filtering of those and cut down the result set. If that view were just a normal node view, it's going against the database. They're constantly hitting that. It's not cached, and, uh, and, it, and it drags down your performance on the MySQL side. If you use Search API to build those views, it's hitting the solar index for those instead. And that's going to alleviate some of that pressure from your MySQL database. Now, initially, the reason we went with Search API is this company actually uses a search technology from a company called Cobeo across their organization. And they do have a desire and a need to incorporate that down the line in a later phase. It wasn't going to make it either in time or in budget for phase one. But because we implemented solar via search API versus directly with a solar module, ideally if a, Sol if a Cobeo search API plugin is created, we can just swap that out because the search API will be the same and the views will work the same. You've just got a, a different backend that's going to swap one for the other. So that's something that we're looking ahead to for a future phase. <coughs> so the next really big challenge was user authentication. Uh, this is actually something that they were told would not be feasible by several vendors. Um, they really just, it, it goes along with that same theme of making this painless for people. They didn't want, especially at a company like this where they've got special badges and three levels of VPN access and credentials coming out of their ears. They didn't want people to have to remember another username and password or manage that separately. So no separate Drupal credentials. They wanted to use claims-based authentication. So claims, for anybody who hasn't worked with them, it's basically Microsoft's term for SAML 2.0. Um, they wanted to go against that identity provider to get that. And they wanted to have all of these accounts be either pre-provisioned or automatically provisioned. They also wanted to leverage this so that it was not only authentication, but it helped drive that personalization too. So when you get that claim token back from Active Directory, uh, from the ADFS server, you get not only the authentication information, but any user attributes that might come along with it for your application. So with that, we can grab user's name, email address, where they work, 
what, what business unit they work in. Um, and on each login, that stuff gets checked, and if it's different from what's been created in the Drupal user object, it's going to overwrite it and update it. So you go off and get married, or I guess divorced, and your last name changes, it's going to update in the system automatically. <coughs> Single sign-on. It's kind of something that whenever anybody says SSO, you kind of shiver and say, okay, well, what do you mean by that? Uh, single sign-on gets, gets confused with federated login a lot. Um, but really when so many of the sites are using ADFS to do their authentication, what they mean is that they want to make sure it works with the integrated Windows authentication. So you've already logged into your laptop, you're sitting at your desk, you're already in the domain. When I hit this site, I shouldn't even see a login form. It just knows who I am. So it was important for us to support that. And it, it makes it so that it's not this other site I'm going to. It's just this thing that's already there. It knows who I am. I don't need to think about it. So again, really pushing this idea of low barrier to entry. Not that people can't handle it, but it's just extra stuff I need to think about. Don't make me think. <coughs> so... We used Simple SAML PHP to help us do this with ADFS. Um, we wanted to keep it simple. No, no active connections to Active Directory, no LDAP queries. Um, not only is it a little bit more of a hassle, but there's more security to think about there, and they wanted to keep this secure. So we don't have privilege to access it directly. We hit the identity provider when we first try to log in. We get back a token with that claim and the attributes, and we parse it and do what we need to. Um, you can run through it, but if, if uh, folks aren't generally familiar with the way that this kind of authentication works, the service provider is your website, the identity provider is the ADFS server, and you create a trust between those so that there's a trusted connection there, and they know that if the identity provider says, yep, this person is who they say they are, then they're going to authenticate you and send back that information to the service provider letting you log in. And people did still have Drupal side user accounts. They were transparently logged into them behind the scenes based on the information that came back. Um, but people never had to think about that. And another really big win with that is that it removes the burden of managing the users from the Drupal side. You don't have to go in and deactivate Drupal user accounts when a person leaves because they're just not going to be able to get through the authentication anymore. So even though they still have a Drupal side user account and they do have a process to go and clean those up in batches, they don't need to do it immediately because they're just not going to be able to get into the account anymore. <coughs> so that brings us to the big Mount Everest of our challenges, which is the extranet. So this was actually a, a really late-breaking requirement. Uh, we had gone through several rounds of looking at all their requirements, and they said, oh, yeah, by the way, we, we need this other site and it's going to be an extranet that's going to have basically the same content as our intranet. But it's going to be separate. It's going to be for contractors, for people who aren't part of our internal network, for people who aren't on VPN. So what does that need to look like? <coughs> okay. So content from the intranet needed to be available in real time. Put it in quotes. Close enough. Um, and the biggest difference is that content that was entered into the intranet and marked as proprietary, containing stuff that should really only be accessible to full employees of the company, um, shouldn't be accessible on the extranet. So we're thinking, okay, we can do that in Drupal pretty easily with views and filters. We can use some kind of context to tell where you're coming from, show you this content but not that content. So we talked more with them, and, okay, well, we need a separate user base. We don't want the user tables to be the same. Okay? And then we need complete system and network separation. So not only can you not display any of that content, the networks and the servers that the extranet site is on can't have any way to ever accidentally access that, that data. It can't even be there at all. So how are we going to do that? They started talking about database replication. They said, well, you don't want to get into that with Drupal. And then finally, they wanted bi-directional sync. So somebody sitting at her desk in the company on the intranet 
sees a cool news article and leaves a comment. Contractor sitting at home is looking at the same news article because it's not proprietary, it's there, and sees her comment pop up. He can leave his own on this completely separate Drupal site, and that needs to pop up on her screen too. So, I mean, at this point, we're just, okay. <laughs> I'm just going to let that simmer for a second. <clears throat> All right, so how can we make this work? As developers, there's a few things that really speak to us, one of them being free beer, but challenges are another. So challenge accepted. How do we make this work? We were actually told by several of our uh, partners and experts that, that the approach is, yeah, this is not a good idea. You should just go back and get them to you know, change their requirement. They said, okay, well, I don't know if we can do that, but I, I think we can make this work. So, we'll, uh, so the intranet is the point of entry. People are entering their content on the intranet. What happens when that happens? How do we get it over to this other site? So, all right, so it's a node. We're saving a node. We can serialize that data. We just send it over with a, a custom web service endpoint. Okay, well, we need to make sure that it actually gets there. So we've got to put some kind of message queue in there. We can't just send it, oh, time's out, never got there, I'm sorry. So we put RabbitMQ into the mix as a message queue to hold those messages and make sure they get there. And then once they're in RabbitMQ, we're going to have, have to have some kind of background processes that run that, that put it into the queue and take it out and process it on the other side. So I wish I had like a laser pointer or something that I could go through this, but um, I don't know how visible it is from the back, but this is kind of a basic architecture of um, how we envisioned this working, where on the left side is the intranet zone, the right side is the extranet zone. The primary driving principle here is that the extranet zone cannot ever be allowed to reach into the intranet zone. It all has to flow in the opposite direction. So you are an editor, and you go in and create a news article on the intranet. It's the little blue boxes where it says Drupal. Um, when you save it, the normal things happen. It gets entered into the database as a new node. It's totally asynchronous, so control is returned to the user. As far as you know, you've done your job. But at the same time, it's going through and packaging up what you just did, putting it using Drupal's Q API onto a Q table, and dropping it there ready to go over, over the wire. Some background processes are watching that. They see it, they pull it out and send it using AMQP, which is the, the transport protocol that RabbitMQ uses over to this RabbitMQ server, which lives in the extranet zone. It's reaching into the extranet, not the other way around. Background processes are running there too. It sees something change on that queue, pulls it off, and then generates a web service call to itself using mostly what comes packaged along with services. There are, there are node services that work great. Um, had to tweak them a little bit, but a lot of that stuff just came out of the box with services. So that generates that web services call to the, and creates that node, and okay, well, now it's there on the extranet. Same thing happens if you delete a node. <coughs> course, nothing is quite that easy. The same thing, by the way, happens in reverse. So if you were to create that comment on the extranet, it would put it into the RabbitMQ queue on its side, and the intranet is just checking that from where it is over here. So it doesn't have to reach out to the intranet to put that in. <coughs> so it turns out people do a whole lot more than just create nodes. Um, this is one of those things that you think, oh, well, this is, this is pretty straightforward, and then you realize, oh, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of edge cases we didn't think about. So we created a, a table here that basically says, okay, what happens when you insert a new node, right? Well, we won't go through every, every cell of the matrix here, so don't get too scared. Um, <laughs> but if it's unrestricted and it's meant to be on the extranet, it's going to generate a put to push it over there. Um, side note, people are, well, the people who've worked with services before are thinking, why a put? Why not post? Um, well, we had to use UUID to coordinate 
this end and that end because the node IDs are going to be different. These are totally separate Drupal installations. So how can we correlate the story on the internet and the story on the extranet? UUID. Um, and that, that required us to use put. Um, the, if you're creating a new, new piece of content that's unrestricted, it's going to put it over there. Creating a new piece of content that is restricted, it's not going to do anything. But there's more here than just creation and deletion and editing. Maybe you pushed out a news article and marked it as unrestricted, went over to the extranet. Suddenly you realize, oh, I probably shouldn't have mentioned that new secret project. And you have to run in there and quickly change it to be restricted. That needs to know to generate a delete message to the extranet as well. So there's a lot of these edge cases that we had to think through. So what, what about files? You know, one of the things that we had to really think about is how do you serialize a node? How do you get its entire object graph of everything that it touches for an entity and then send it over? You know, we've got embedded images in our content. Do we do all of that when we send that node over? And some of those images might contain proprietary content as well. So what we ended up doing was saying, okay, when somebody uploads a file, an image, we'll sync it over at that point assign it a UUID, and then when the node that references it gets synced over, if it's there, it's there. If it's not, it's not. You have some checkings so that, you know, you can't create a story that references something that's proprietary. It's complicated. That's the basic idea. So this is just kind of speaking to some of those edge cases. There are a lot of things that we had to do in addition to that and things that we didn't think about at first. In addition to making sure it's not proprietary, well, kind of have to remove all the workbench and scheduling attributes from the node because that got totally messed up when it was sent over to another environment. And there's really no reason to have draft content over there anyway. So if you unpublish content, y there's no benefit to having unpublished content sit on this marionette controlled server that nobody's actually logging into to, to edit content on. The challenges of having a separate user base are pretty significant too because those nodes can't be owned by the same users that they were when they were on the intranet. So everything got set to the anonymous user when it's sent over. We use JSON encoding to serialize it and send it over and rsync commands to send the files over. <coughs> One other thing that we had to take into account was a full synchronization. So this works great once both of these sites are bootstrapped and up and running, but at some point, Everybody was putting content into this one site and we didn't have an extranet running yet. How do we get everything over there? Well, we've got to somehow have some full sync process that is used not only in that sense, but if something ever goes wrong and they need to make sure the two are in sync once again, that full sync will take care of that. Super tricky with um, entity references, chicken and egg problems where things have circular references, you have to half sync something over, and do it again, and it, it's a fun problem to figure out. <coughs> so finally, the comment sync, that bi-directional syncing, again, really tricky because of the separate user bases. You know, we can do the same thing and set comments to be owned by anonymous, but, you know, if you're looking at a, a defense company's intranet and all of their comments in the stories, you don't want to see a whole lot of comments by anonymous with either a lowercase or a capital A. So instead, we added a field to comments so that when somebody left a comment, it grabbed their user attributes on that environment they were on, put it into a, just a static table. And when we display the comments, we display that field instead of the actual user attributes. <coughs> we also had to make sure that the sync processes would only sync things like comments over. Um, you know, we, we never wanted to run into a situation, even if people weren't editing content directly on this extranet site, that they accidentally saved something and overwrote in the opposite direction. So content, entity content only flows in that direction. Comments sync bidirectionally. And finally, the background processes that run and enable this. Um, we actually use the background process module in Drupal that spawns Apache threads that can take care of background processes. It's got its own keep alive stuff, but we found that sometimes they didn't keep alive um, for whatever reason. 
The AMQP lib uh, is great in PHP, but it's not the most robust implementation of AMQP. Um, so there were some issues there. And then sometimes there's just, oh, the, the admins on their side rebooted the server. Well, those were running as Apache threads and now they're not anymore. So we have a, a cron process that goes and just checks the health of all of that stuff every so often. So rather than starting the services, we actually changed it so that people would set a flag, whether they intended it to be running or not. And if it wasn't and it was intended to be running, it would restart them. Uh, there's a whole UI in the site for looking at the status of this, how many nodes need to be synced over, what the status of these processes are. And uh, we wrote this actually for ourselves while we were debugging it, but made it pretty for them so that from Drush they could run something and get a quick heads up on what the status of everything was. <coughs> so the result of all this, we launched last September, at the end of September, uh, to praise pretty much unanimously across the organization. The, uh, on day one, uh, or I guess at the end of day one, the VP of communications sent out something to everybody on the team, not just our team, but the, the internal team at the company, that this was a home run. It was really the first time that they were able to garner that consensus across the organization and have that unified communications platform that meant so much to them. It resulted in a greatly simplified experience for all of the employees to get and see what they needed to do. And uh, not just for HR stuff, but figuring out what people across the organization were up to. There's a lot of things that they should be proud of that they're doing across the organization. And there was really no way to communicate that to people before. But they also recognized, because uh, the email that came shortly after that one was, let's look forward to 2.0. Um, <laughs> It's only the first step. They've got a long list of enhancements, and now that they've seen what this platform can do for them and how easy it can be to manage this content with Drupal, uh, the sky's the limit. And uh, we are continuing to work with them um, on really figuring out what that vision looks like and making it a reality for them as well. So that's about all I've got. Um, there's a lot of stuff that we're not able to, to touch upon and a lot of things that were very lightly touched upon because there's, it's just such a large project. If you guys have any questions, I'd love to answer them here. And if you think of anything down the line, um, you know, feel free to find one of us or, or send us uh, a tweet or an email or come look for us. And we, uh, this isn't really a place to come to find a job maybe, but if, uh, if people are looking, we are always looking too. And we're always working on cool, difficult projects like that. So, thank you. Nope. There we go. That's better. <laughs> um, so, you, you guys were talking about using memcache. Um, did you do an analysis on whether you wanted to use Memcache or Redis, or did you consider Redis? I'm just curious about that. We did. So this is one of those mega corporation things. So we had already had their security team go through and vet and approve Memcache. And we went back and said, you know what? I think for this instance, you know, Redis is really picking up speed. We'd like to use it and try it instead. It should be just a really a, a swap in for it. And they said, well, we already had everything look at Memcache. I don't know if we can ask him to go back and do that again. <laughs> phase two. <laughs> not, not the company, phase two of the project. Hi. Um, when you folks mentioned that uh, during the sync process, you couldn't use a post request with UUIDs, and I was just wondering why that is. Sure. So it's... Um, it's because the post method was used to, to, uh, to create content with UUID and services. The put method is used to create and update content, and you didn't necessarily know what the status of that content was on the other site. So it was just easier to basically say, update, and if it's there, it's there and it updates, and if it's not, it'll create it. So that was really Thanks. the end of that. Sure. Hi there. Um, just a quick question. The, there's a box uh, on the views UI that says something like use 
slave server if possible. Um, I've always wanted to check that box and have a situation where I could check it, but I've never run into it yet. So I was just wondering if, if that's a box that you were able to check and, and use in some, in, on some of the views. No, we, we, don't, uh, we don't actually endorse even for MySQL slavery. So. <laughs> um, no, it's, we, we actually didn't use that. We, um, God, now you're making me really curious. I'm going to have to go click through and find that. <laughs> Sorry, that's not the answer you were looking for. But no, we, we didn't implement it with uh, with this particular build. All right, thanks. thanks. Um, you mentioned with SAML 2.0, Windows Auth, um, and then once logged in there, connecting into Drupal mm -hmm. with SAML. Um, any thoughts on where where to find that out? I mean, the rest of it all makes sense. Yeah, it's doable. Sorry, I, I, uh, I didn't really go into much detail on that. We, we used uh, Simple SAML PHP, which is um, a separate piece of software that runs and handles those handshakes with um, the ADFS or SAML server, the IDP. Um, you set it up completely outside of Drupal um, and establish the trust, um, you know, key exchange and all of that. And once that's working and you can test that all the attributes come through and the authentication works, there's actually a really great Drupal module called Simple SAML PHP Auth that's like a, it's an interface to that. So you point it at the local installation of Simple SAML PHP and then you can tell it, oh, you know, um, override the Drupal login form with this, you know, only allow people to log in with that um, or only allow certain user classes to log in with their actual Drupal credentials. Uh, we ended up leaving the user form um, so that super admins could log in or somebody could get in if, you know, for whatever reason, ADFS was down. Um, and then we had uh, a check on hook in it that basically said, hey, are you authenticated? If not, redirect to um, this URL that bounces you off to simple SAML, log me in. And then there was uh, some custom code, but once it comes back and it's got that token, parses out all the attributes from it, um, populates the Drupal user object with all the new stuff. So, And it's the same whether the person is logging in for the first time and doesn't have an account, or the third time, or the hundredth time. It, it's just all transparent to them. Cool. Thank you. Sure. No problem. Hi. Good afternoon. You'd mentioned that uh, you were leveraging some of the performance from the, uh, the Apache Lucy or the Apache Solar mm -hmm. um, implementation. Would I... And hypothetically, get the same, um, be able to leverage that from from an alternate solution like Google Search Appliance. So, Google Search Appliance, to the best of my knowledge, can't be integrated with Search API. Um, Google Search Appliance is kind of this thing that you just it's separate. You set it up and you point it at your site, and there are some integration modules that'll more tightly integrate what comes back from Google Search Appliance into your site. Um, I know you can get JSON and parse it out and do all kinds of stuff like that, but it's really more of something that um, Google Search Appliance goes out and crawls your site and creates an index, and then it's searchable the way that Google intends it to be. Um, Search API has a few back-end plugins. There's Solar. Um, you can just use a database um, to do it. Uh, th there's a few others, but it, you can't integrate Google Search Appliance with your views is, is the, the big thing. <laughs> okay, that's solar is great. Google search appliance is good for really big companies who just want to search. I'm gonna get myself in trouble. I'll stop now. I I didn't do it. Uh, it this isn't the music playing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yep, absolutely. So the question was, uh, this gentleman also works in, in government, and um, w just question about migration of data and how you deal with that, um, not being able to bring down proprietary content in the migration data to test with. So uh, as
as Ted mentioned, we, we did a lot of the early development locally with migrate classes that we set up. Uh, we set them up initially to help us bootstrap the site with content, but then they were leveraged later on to help the, the client migrate their real data into the site. Um, so we created representative content locally. Um, so at least on our personal environments, we didn't have, for most of the time, their actual content. Um, they did provide us the only way that we're able to connect to their servers. Um, we didn't just have to use VPN and their credentials. We had to use their hardware. So, you know, they provided us all with these wonderfully blazing fast, I'm being facetious, laptops that, um, that we had to use to do that. And it was okay to bring their content down onto those. Um, they actually allowed us to install um, uh, VMware or VirtualBox on those so that we could run local servers on those machines and not have to be in Windows. Um, so we were able to do it with those. But other than that, yeah, it was migration of representative content instead of their actual content. And, uh, and yeah, we heavily leveraged the migrate module with uh, custom classes to create content from CSVs, XML, however they could export that data from their uh, legacy systems. All right, well, that, that looks like it. If, again, if any of you guys have more questions, feel free to come up and talk to us if you were just microphone shy or uh, contact us afterwards. Thank you.